looking at ordering your private world, if you buy a new copy on the internet, it's going to look like this. This is the new, this is the new uh, reprint of it. Like I said, that book's been around 30 30- I want to talk tonight about living as a called person. Robert told me, he says, I've been reading through this book that, that you recommended. And he says, I really like that fifth chapter about, God, about John the Baptist. And I said, well, good, because that's what we're looking at tonight is John the Baptist. Last week we talked a little bit about Saul. Saul was a driven person and not a very pretty picture. John the Baptist, on the other hand, is the flip side of the coin. And that's what we want to look at tonight. Being a called person. Being somebody who, 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 you know who you are, you know why you're here, you know where you're headed in life. You, you may not have everything all together, but at least you know where you're headed and you know what God wants of you in life. And you're trying in every way that you can to direct your life to that kind of standard. And, you know, it's process, isn't it? It's process. Uh, Woe on anybody that sits here and thinks, well, but I've already, I've already got all that worked out. Well, good. Then let me know. You can start teaching next Sunday because the rest of us don't. We're in process. But you've got to make some choices. Memo to the disorganized. If my private world is in order, it'll be because I see myself as Christ's steward. And not as master of my purpose, my role, and my identity. You've got to be clear. If you're going to bring your inner life together the way it should be, you've got to figure out who's in charge. And that's a dicey thing. Because our human nature is not to give up control. If there's one thing all of us crave in life, in one form or another, it's control. Violent, angry people desire control. Passive victims desire control. They just use the passive mode as their way of manipulating. Uh, Everybody likes control. Some of us like it a lot more than others, right? But everybody to some extent. To some extent, we have to have control. But the question is, remember the Wizard of Oz? Remember the movie, The Wizard of Oz? When at the very, 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 very end, with everything that had been going on in the land of Oz, at the very end, they get into the main palace, and some idiot reaches up and pulls the curtain back. And they find out that there's this really short, dumpy, weird-looking little crazy man who's out there pulling all the levers and spinning all the dials, and it turns out he's been choreographing everything that goes on. And he had this machine that when he'd talk into it, it would sound terrible. And he wasn't anything like that, but he was the one who was controlling everything that went on. So it's the difference between what you want to project... And what's really going on inside? Who pilots your plane? Who captains your ship? Who makes the calls? That's what we want to talk about. In the 1850s, a book was written called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Have any of you ever read it? Anybody ever read it? Yeah. Thank you. You know, most people hear about these books, they never read them. I can't stand to hear about a book and not go read it. Harriet Beecher Stowe, very unusual at that day and time for a woman to publish a book, published a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin that became the fomenting source of the abolitionist movement that led to the Civil War. I mean, it was, it was, that book was quoted more by the abolitionists than the Bible. Because it was a book that told the story of an old slave named Tom. And Tom, it, it basically it exposed the ugly, the, the ugly underbelly of the peculiar institution that was slavery. Because Uncle Tom was, was 
torn from his wife, his children, his family, his home, and just for no reason whatsoever other than the whim of a, a master, he was sold to another master. Now, his original master was fairly kind, fairly considerate. His new master, Simon Legree, was cruel and vicious and sadistic. And so Tom goes through this crisis in his life. How do you deal with it? This is wrong. The, the concept of breaking the family up was bad enough, but then to throw him into this situation. Several years later, a man named F.W. Borum wrote a book called A Casket of Cameos in which he describes Tom's response to the cruelty of his new master. I want you to listen to this. A little later, poor Tom was writhing under the cruel lash of his new owner. But, says Mrs. Stowe, the blows fell only upon the outer man and not, as before, on the heart. Tom stood submissive, and yet Legree could not hide from himself the fact that his power over his victim had gone. As Tom disappeared in his cabin and Legree wheeled his horse suddenly around, there passed through the tyrant's mind one of those vivid flashes that often send the lightning of conscience across the dark and wicked soul. He understood full well that it was God who was standing between him and Tom, and he blasphemed God. I want you to notice the statement in, in, in uh, italics. The lash of the whip fell only on the outer man and not, as before, on the heart. He could whip Tom, but he couldn't own him. He couldn't defeat him. See, to me, that's a great description of what a Christian ought to be like in crisis. Are we going to take a whipping sometimes? Yeah, you bet. Sometimes of the cruelest sort. But does it reach the soul? Or is there a quiet dignity deep inside that says, if you need to hit me again, go ahead. But I'm not going to hate you for it. It is the sense of certainty for which we seek when we compare driven people and called people. Calm people have strength from within, perseverance and power that are impervious to the blows from without. Have you ever seen that rare person that just no matter how much the storm rages, they just seem to be calm, they seem to just work their way through it? You know, do they cry? Yes. Do they worry some? Of course. But there's always with that quiet, assurance deep inside but I'm going to be okay I'll come out the other end of this I'll have some bruises and rips and tears and I'll be beaten and battered a little bit but daggummit I'll make it I'm going to be there when it's over with that's a neat idea that's a neat concept how come some it was something now the, the fancy psychological term for that nowadays is resilience why are some people more resilient? Because some people are more centered than others. Called people can, can come from anywhere and represent almost any kind of people. You don't have to be a certain kind of person to be called. You don't have to come from a certain background. You don't have to have certain qualifications. You can be male or female. You can be old or young. You can be tall or short. You can be educated or not. You can grow up in a church all your life, or you might not grow up in a church at all. And by the way, growing up in a church all your life does not necessarily guarantee that your life is organized and centered. In fact, many times it almost is counterintuitive. The Pharisees thought they were the religious leaders, but they were among the most driven and disorganized people in their culture. So you have that. What makes all the difference is who you're called by. You look at the disciples. They're a very nondescript bunch. 
I mean, name me one disciple that, that we would consider, you know, prime leadership material. Maybe Peter, because he was the captain of a ship. Oh, well, he's, there you go, got a leader. Except he was loose-lipped and hot-tempered, which I guess could, as a driven person, force you into positions of leadership, makes you an altogether unpleasant person to be around or to work for or with. So who else is really, a, you know, name me one hot shot among the apostles. <sighs> most of them were marginal at best. And yet they became the most dynamic force for righteousness in the history of mankind. Why? Because they were called by Jesus. Makes all the difference. John the Baptist is a really terrific example of a called person. Boy, he's a, he's a good one. He confronted his contemporaries with their need for change and God's call to repentance. He never minced his words. He was clearly focused on the work God had called him to do. Did everybody like what John said? Do you think a lot of people shook their heads and walked the other way? Do you think a lot of people criticized him? Do you think a lot of people naysayed him and said ugly things about him? Who did, who did Israel, woe unto you Israel, who, who killed the prophets that came before you? What, are they, what do you do to a prophet? You run him off and you kill him. You try to shut him up. Because prophets speak for God at a time when people aren't listening to God. And they don't want to hear what a prophet has to say. They don't, no sinner wants to hear that he's a sinner. No rebel wants to hear he's a rebel. No lost person wants to hear, hey, you're lost. That's a lousy message. But it's true. And it needs to be heard. I don't get the impression John the Baptist was a guy that said, now, I'll be careful what I say because I don't want to offend anybody. John, you know, was a little more direct than that. In fact, when the Pharisees criticized him, he says, oh, well, who called you out to listen to my preaching, you bucket of snakes? <laughs> yeah. I don't even think Jesus used that colorful a term to, although in Matthew 23, he calls them hypocrites, mask wearers. So John had a very clear sense of his job in more ways than one, not just positively, but negatively. On one occasion, John was told that the crowds and even some of his own disciples were turning to Jesus, listening to his teaching and even being baptized by the disciples of Jesus. When told of his declining popularity, in other words, they said, hey, you're losing your church. They're voting with their feet, buddy. They're going across the, they're going across the valley and following that Jesus guy. Man, I'm, I mean, I'm telling you, he's hot stuff right now. Your time's come and gone. How did John respond to that? John replied, no one can receive. Now listen to this. Listen to this centeredness, this maturity. Hey, no one receives anything unless God gives it from heaven. What's he saying about his own ministry? Where did it come from? God, where did success come from? So if they go the other way, why? Well, maybe there's somebody that has come along that God wants them to listen to more. In fact, that was why John was sent, wasn't it? Was to pass them off to somebody else. God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I've told you I'm not the Messiah. I'm only the one here to prepare the way for him. It's the bridegroom who marries the bride. And the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear the vows. You know, if you're the best man at the wedding, your job's not to get all the attention at the wedding. They don't want you to get up there and when they get ready to do the vows, take the mic from the preacher and say, oh, listen, I have a few things I'd like to say. And by the way, i got a little number I'd like to sing for you, okay? <laughs> yeah, this is a good one, man. I remember I did this one back in high school. It'd be very inappropriate, wouldn't it? Who's, who's the focal point of the wedding? Right in the groom. That's why when couples come to me to get married, they're all worried about, well, my mother wants this much. Hey, wait, 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 wait a minute. I don't care what your mother wants. It's your wedding. What do you want? Well, I'd rather do so and so. Then that's what we're going to do. And if I don't like it, tell them the preacher said so. They get mad at me. 
because the wedding is yours. It's about you. I want you to walk out of here feeling great about yourself and being absolutely silly in the face happy about your wedding because it's your wedding. If mama wants a wedding done a certain way, tell her to go out and get married again. And she can do it the way she wants it. It's not her wedding. You know? I mean... <laughs> Bridegroom marries the bride, bridegroom's friend just stands, hears the vows. Therefore, listen to this, I'm filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. That is a profound statement from somebody with the kind of presence that John the Baptist had. I mean, this guy was like a minor rock star. Thousands were coming out to hear him preach. Jesus even came to him to be baptized. And now he says, oh, that was just all. I was just the opening act. I'm, I'm, not, the main, I'm not the main line group. I'm just the opening act. I'm the one they list underneath and also, and then those small letters at the bottom of the marquee. Let me give you some ideas about John's concept of, of God's calling. And maybe this is something we can translate into our lives. First, John's concept of God call, God's calling is life is stewardship. Life by stewardship. That's, that's, he understood that. He didn't consider the crowds his. They weren't his followers. They were God's followers. They weren't, it wasn't his message. It was God's message. It wasn't his forgiveness he was offering. It was God's forgiveness that was being offered. They all belonged to God. His job was just to direct their attention to God and his will. That requires you to be totally selfless. This is not my church now this is my family in a different sense of the word this is not my church you know if the elders come up and say Doug we're going to hire a new preacher that's fine if that's what they think is best it's not my church to hold on to and to look at the, the a new guy coming in and saying well yeah, I don't know who you think you are. Do you know who I am? Yeah, nobody. John the Baptist. You know? A class that you teach is not your class. It's just the class you teach. Lesson you give is not your lesson. It's just a lesson you're giving. It's a different perspective on things. And by the way, Translate that not just into church things, but into life things. For instance, here's what a steward does. What does a steward do? A steward is simply chosen to properly manage something for the owner until the owner comes to take it back. A steward doesn't own one single thing he stewards or she stewards. Steward doesn't own any of that stuff. Remember the, remember the master that gave the five talents of gold, the two talents of gold, the one talent of gold? Whose gold was it? It was the master's gold. While he was gone and they were using it, whose gold was it? Yeah, you bet, because when he came home, guess what? He asked for it back. Why? It's his gold. Now, Translate that into your personal life. Look at this. John presents us with an important modern principle. For his crowds might be our careers, our physical assets, our natural and spiritual gifts, our health. Where do those come from? They come from God. Who's the owner? God. Who's the steward? Me, you. And he's going to come back one day and want to know what we did with it. That's the whole point of that parable of the, of the talents, right? I mean, the parable of the talents is a judgment scene story. 
when the king comes back off the long trip, when Jesus comes back after being gone such a long time, he's going to call the servants together and say, all right, this is what I gave you. What would you do with it? How about your time? Every minute you have in your life belongs to God, and he simply loans it to you. Our children are on loan. Our possessions are on loan. Our financial resources, our jobs, our talents, our abilities, our interests, they're on loan. Not ours. Well, what do I do with my money's my own business? Now, that's a driven person right there. That's not a called person. That's not the language of a called person. A called person by God would never say, what I do with my money's my own business. That's no, God's business because your money's his. It's my business how I use my time. No, it's God's business. Now, see, when you think about it that way, you look at your whole life, every dimension of your life is God's business. And he's not meddling in your business. He's meddling in his own business. He has a right. If you don't think your time belongs to God, let God take back the next five minutes and see how you do. That wouldn't be good, would it? John's concept of God's calling, secondly, allowed him to know who he really was. He had a real sense. He knew who he was. He was secure in himself. John didn't go around, you know, putting his finger, wetting his finger and holding it up, see which way the wind's blowing so he'd know how to preach or what to preach or what he ought to say or do. You know, he just, he knew what God wanted him to say, and he said what God wanted him to say. He said it the way God wanted him to say it. Well, so-and-so doesn't like that. Well, you know, I'm so sorry. Let me say it again. Maybe he just didn't hear it right. Or maybe he didn't want to hear it. So um, knowing who he was. Now, the key to John knowing who he was was he first of all had to know who he was not. What's the first thing John said in that statement we read earlier from John 3? I am not the Messiah. So quit laying the Messiah thing on me. That's not who I am. I was never called to be the Messiah. God didn't put me on earth to be the Messiah. I know that. You may want me to be the Messiah, but what would have happened had he tried to fill that role? Well, over a, over a period of time, it would have disintegrated, wouldn't it? Because it wasn't of God. You know, one of the wisest statements made in the Bible is made by a man whom, so far as we know, never became a believer. And that was when, the, uh, when one of the uh, uh, scholars in the law made the statement to the Jewish council when they were going to persecute the early disciples, the early apostles. He said, listen, before you put them to death, you might want to think about this. If what they're saying is of God, Well, what he says is, if what they're saying is not of God, it'll go away anyway because it can't survive. House against itself can't stand. But he says, if what they are saying is of God and you put them to death, you will be seen by God as persecuting and resisting God's own will. Are you sure you want to play that hand to the end? He says, leave them alone. If they're not of God, God will get rid of them anyway. If they are of God, you don't, you don't want to mess with that. Huh? John knew who he was because, first of all, he knew who he wasn't. And part of that means I have to know, first of all, that I'm not the master. I'm not the pilot. I'm not the captain. I have to understand that. I not only have to understand it, I have to accept it. You understand it, not accept it. By contrast, driven people allow their true identities to be defined by inner desires, outward circumstances, the expectations of others, host of other externals. How many, how many things around us try to define us as to who we are every day? Call them expectations or whatever. They can be internal, they can be external. They can be personal or they can be somebody else. 
And people in the world, they love to squeeze you. What does Paul say? Don't be conformed to this world. I love one translation that says, don't let this world squeeze you into its mold. Because once you get melted down and squeezed into the mold, you come out looking like whatever the mold says you're supposed to look like, even if it's not very pretty. You know? Because the mold of the world is defective. It's ugly. And if you let the world squeeze you into it, then when you come out of the mold, you're going to be ugly. Now, you'll be just like all the other uglies that come out of that mold, but that doesn't make for a very good feeling about yourself. Driven people are concerned with image and perception, not stable inner identity. What they do is indistinguishable from what they are. This is why many of them, when they retire, completely disintegrate. If they can retire. And a lot of times if you're driven, you're not able to. You can't, you can't handle it. Because your identity is taken up. Now, I'm going to say this, and, and I know this is, I'm going to make a good sexist comment here, okay? I think this is especially true of males. Because in our society, it's changing. It is constantly evolving and changing. But at this point, we are still in a society where men are primarily identified with what kind of work they do. And so for a man to have to give up his work is to give up his identity. He's not a person anymore. You hear many retired men say, well, I'm just worthless. I can't do anything anymore. See where the identity becomes fused with the job? And it becomes even more a problem in a society where the average person will hold five to eight jobs in their lifetime and not necessarily in the same field. People change jobs nowadays like some of us change socks, you know, if you wear socks. You wear socks, don't you? George doesn't always wear socks. He likes to wear them apostle sandals. We need to ponder this matter of identity carefully. I'm dead serious. We need to really think about this question of who am I? In my own mind, who am I? Am I secure in who I am? Am I okay with who I am? That is a big, big factor in learning how to deal with criticism. Because people that find that you have a very fluid sense of identity will eat you alive. They will eat you up. They will jerk you all over the place. Because you're, you're not secure in who you are, and so they criticize who you are and suggest who you ought to be. And that's a, an important message to get over to our kids. But please don't shake your head yes and say, oh, our kids need to hear that. Most of us need to hear that too. Because we live in a world that tries to squeeze you into the mold. Uh, when I would talk with my little girls at school, we would spend a lot of time talking about body image. Body image for young girls growing up is a really, really a massive, a huge issue that devastates many of us. Most of the female suicides, young female suicides that take place are struggling greatly, massively with body image issues. That's one of the driving issues in their life. You're, you're too much this, not enough that. You don't this and you do that and you, you know, and, and no matter what you do or how you dress or how you walk or where you go or, or whatever, you, you know, somebody criticizes you. You have a lot of shaming that goes on on social media right now. A lot of, a lot of shaming of especially young girls. And, uh, you know, yeah, I'd like to get a hold of some of the guys that are doing the shaming and, you know, get four or five of us, take them out behind the shed and shame them a little bit. That's pathetic. That is pathetic. 
as far as I'm concerned, guys that do that to girls are mentally ill. They are mentally ill. Well, and that's just another form of mental illness, isn't it? Girls are mean. And it, it starts when they're about two years old and gets worse as they get older. Oh, listen, I, I didn't want to ever go beyond elementary. I love dealing with elementary school because I never get above fourth grade. You get in fifth, sixth, seventh grade, oh, my. Oh, my. Have you ever seen a pack of wild dogs grab a, a, a half-dead animal? Yeah, that's a little junior high girls on the playground. Uh, I like this statement. At the moment when the praise of the crowds became thunderous, the voice of God from within John became even louder. Isn't that a neat statement? The louder the crowds got for John, the more God's voice shouted at John, hey, buddy, just remember who you are. You're mine. I've got you back. You're okay. I'm pleased with you. We've got to learn, folks, that in a world that's very secular and very ungodly, you and God make a majority of two. And that's all the votes you need. I don't need, on any moral issue, I only need two votes. Mine and God's. Oh, but there's a lot of people. Yeah, but their votes don't count. They don't count. The whole world's opinion counts as one vote. Mine and God's count as two, and that always wins in, in any vote, two to one. That's the way it's got to be. If you're going to be a Christian, that's the way it's got to be. On your use of your time, your resources, your talents, your influence, your personal life. It's got to be two to one. God wins every time. That's, that's the vote. It kept him focused on his God-given task. The voice spoke more convincingly because John had first, when he was out in the desert, got himself together. He'd already... See, the reason John found it easy during the hard times to make the right choice is because he'd already made the right choice. This is not... I'll tell you something. I'm going to be honest with you. This is not the kind of stuff you figure out in the heat of the moment. This is the kind of stuff you get put into place long before that happens. You have your levees and your locks and your dams in place and locked down and secure long before the heavy rain comes. Because if you wait until the floodwaters start coming up to sandbag the house, you might as well kiss that house goodbye. It's gone. It's gone. You might... You need to think about where you're building before the flood comes so that you don't build in the floodplain to start with. They found that out in Nashville a few years ago, didn't they? They allowed, authorized all these houses in the floodplain. Well, now that floodplain is a dedicated water retention area. And all the houses have been, at very great expense to the city, have been bought and raised. Why? Because some genius finally figured out that if you build a house below sea level, you're going to get wet. The city of New Orleans is 12 feet below sea level. What kind of a moron builds a city 12 feet below sea level? Well, we got flooded. Well, yeah, dummy, of course you did. You build your house on a seaside cliff. Don't cry when the waves make the, lift, the, the cliff collapse and your house falls. We need help. Yeah, you need help, all right. You need help on deciding where you're going to build your house next time. That's just dumb. And, and somebody says, well, that's awful harsh on your part. What does Jesus say in one of the most obvious parables in the Bible? What happens if you build your house on the sand? It's going to fall when the... Whoa! Took a genius to figure that out, didn't it? Jesus knew that 2,000 years ago, and he didn't even have a degree in engineering. You build your house on the sand, it falls when the rain comes. Well, you know, it's as true, and Jesus' point was, it's as true in life as it is in construction. And that means that you have to think about where you're going to build your house before you start building. John's concept of God's calling gave him an unwavering sense of purpose. He knew why he was here. He knew what he was supposed to be doing. To those who questioned him regarding his feelings about the growing popularity of 
the man from Nazareth, he said, well, I'm the best man at the wedding. What do you think I'm supposed to do? He knew who he was. Well, that's not what I thought you were. Well, I'm sorry that your thinking was wrong. But I know who I am. The best man's fulfilled his purpose most admirably. When he draws no attention to himself, focuses all the attention on the bride and groom. And that's exactly what John ended up doing. Another thing John's concept of God's calling gave him was an unswerving commitment to his work. He not only knew what his job was, but he was dedicated to doing it. Why? Because God is captaining the ship. If the captain says, all ahead full, then what do the people on the ship do? It goes all ahead full. If he tells them to reverse course, they reverse course. Not because they thought it was a good idea, but because the captain is controlling the ship, and that's what he said to do. How many times would we keep ourselves out of the messes of life if we'd just go where the captain had told us to take the boat in the first place? But you sail it into bad territory, you know, during World War II, who was Bull Halsey? You know, who, you know who Bull Halsey was? Bull Halsey was one of the leading admirals in the United States Navy. He decided one time that to save time, he would take an entire task force through the middle of a typhoon. He lost five ships. That's more than they lost in most battles with the Japanese battlecruisers. Five ships were lost to the storm. What an idiot. You don't take vessels through typhoons. You're supposed to have better sense than that. In that case, the guy steering the boat gave a bad order. You know? Sometimes, like Bull Halsey, we think that we're just going to take ourselves right through the typhoon. And then we don't understand when we get out the other side why, you know, 20% of the task force is missing. Well, what did you expect? God had already told you that wasn't a good place to go. You went there anyway. How many of you have ever advised one of your kids not to do something and then had them do it? And come back and cry and whine to you about how bad it turned out when they did it. And what did you say to them? I told you so. She's got this down. I told you so. <laughs> the difference between us and God is it does not make God feel better to look at us amidst the ruins of our life and say, I told you so. That doesn't pleasure God. Now, sometimes as parents... It, it, it validates us, right? I told you so, dummy. You know, see, I am smarter than you. God knows he's smarter. than God's self-identity doesn't require that he be right. He just is right. And it doesn't satisfy him to look at us and say, well, look what you did. He already knew how that was going to come out. Finally, John's concept of being called filled his life with a sense of joy and peace. You know, you don't have all of the angst. You don't have all of the anxiety and the stress and the worry of, oh, oh, I wonder what Patsy thinks of me today. I wonder if George liked my sermon. I wonder if Fred likes the outfit I'm wearing today. I, I wonder if Eugene, you know, if he likes the length of the lesson, which I know by the way, Eugene, nobody here likes the length of my sermons. But. Hey, if you spend your whole life worrying about stuff like that, you, you have no joy. There's no joy in life. Pfft. You spend your life getting jerked around like a puppet on a string to whoever, whoever likes this or that. You've got to know who you are and why you're here. And you've got to be committed to doing that, knowing that it's anchored in your identity with God. He didn't feel the need to compete with anyone. He didn't have to live up to anyone's expectations. All he needed to do was have the satisfaction of knowing that he was faithfully serving God and, know, going, and doing in his life what God wanted him to do. Somebody says, well, your friends aren't going to like that. You know, it doesn't matter. I don't care if my friends don't like what I'm doing. If I'm convinced I'm doing it for God and it pleases him, 
That's why I'm, my argument all along has been our goal in life is to make God happy. If God smiles when you do it, you're in good shape. If he frowns when you're doing it, what did you what were you thinking? And that's where you got to get into this. Cuz he tells you the things in here, he tells you the things that make him happy. He also tells you the things that tick him off. And then you just have to make choices. But at least you have some objective basis for making choices. What other, when others thought that John might be worried about ending up as a failure, they discovered that he was actually quite satisfied with himself in spite of the fact that his audiences were leaving him. The reason? John's self-evaluation was based on his private world, where his real values were fully formed in concert with God. He was okay with it because he knew God was okay with it. That's all he needed. Question, how did John get to be the way he was? How did he arrive at being called? And I'm just going to give you three quick things. We're just about finished here. First, John, and not everybody has this advantage, but he was clearly shaped by godly parents in his case. If you look at the story of John's birth, his parents were old. God blessed them with a, 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 a child of miracle, and he told them. He told them up front that he was going to be the forerunning prophet of the Messiah. So, and, and it's, it's obvious from the way Luke words, if the, if those of you that were in this, have been in the study of Luke with me, it's obvious from the way Luke describes John's parents. They were devout, godly, God-centered, righteous people. Obviously, when God promised them this child with a specific purpose, they bought into it totally, and they nurtured him as best they could to fulfill that purpose. Tradition suggests that they, he didn't keep his parents very long. And that leads to the second area, which is he spent a lot of time alone with God reflecting on his mission and on the God who called him out. I've got a video I need to show you sometime. It's done by uh, uh, Francis Chan. And uh, it's about the wonder of God. And what he says in this video is it's 15 minutes of the universe. It's 15 minutes of visual of the universe. All of the unbelievable, unbelievable, incredible things that go on in the universe. Did you know there are 350 million galaxies? Galaxies galaxies why would God create 350 million galaxies maybe he's trying to impress you with how big he is that's pretty big I can't even write the number out and God made them with all the stars and all the suns and all the black holes and all of the this and the that and the other and all the dust and the particles and everything that goes into every one of the planets and every one of the moons and every one of the stellar bodies and all the pieces of all the galaxies, of all the pieces of the universe everywhere, not counting all the cool stuff that's here on Earth. You ever enjoy watching the nature films that show all like the show the flowers in time lapse that come out of the ground and grow up and reach maturity and then bloom and then drop and put their seeds down and start all over? You ever watch that and realize that that happens year after year after year after year after year after year, just like clockwork? And those flowers know just when to drop, just when to come up, just how to do it. The birds and other animals they know just when to migrate in to time the birth of their young ones. At the perfect time when all of the right seeds are available from all the right plants that knew when to come up. How smart is God? How smart is God that he can make a little tiny bird that can fly backwards? And fight like a demon. You ever watched them? They mean her in snakes. It's amazing. It's amazing. Do you ever sit on the edge of the ocean and just watch the water? 
it just melts your brain. Have you ever been in a place where there's so little light that you can actually see? How many of you have ever actually seen the Milky Way? I mean, actually seen it, minus the ambient light. See, we're always used to having light around. Go to a place sometime where there's no light and look up and see the Milky Way, and it'll just melt your brain cells. And to realize that all those are just the center part of our arm of our galaxy that's one of 350 million just like it. One of the reasons many of the writers of the Bible were such godly men is because they spent hours sitting out in fields like David where they didn't have city lights around and all that stuff and they could look up and he could, he could just in a moment of thought write the words, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. He wasn't saying that to be poetic. He was saying that because that was his experience was the, the glory of God. We don't have time for that kind of stupid stuff anymore, do we? We're too busy. We have too many important things to do. To, to contemplate God. And then on another occasion, David says, when I look at all these things around me and I think to myself, what is man that you would give a hoot about him? Why should you care about me? One little squirt, little pipsqueak sitting on a hill in the middle of a gigantic area on a massive planet in the center of a gargantuan universe. Why do you give a rip about me? And yet, you do. John learned the word, and he identified himself with parts of the word as part of who he is. And so that's part of the journey to being a called person. You've got to get in touch with you. You've got to get in touch with God. You've got to get in touch with God's Word.